my life from destruction And yeah, I'm burning the seeds for me He redeemed my life from destruction Which honors him. Bring that which he has ransomed from the grave. This new life in Jesus. Clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands. Your heart. Bring that which honors Jesus. Bring that which is worthy of His name. Bring that which He has ransomed from destruction. Clean hands. And a pure heart. We will sing, O oh God, of your love forever. We will sing of your mercies, Lord. We will sing of your faith. 
my redeemer lives and he stands in the earth right now my redeemer lives and he stands in my life right now oh our redeemer lives and he stands in the midst of his church hallelujah
Hosanna to the King. Oh, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Oh, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. ourselves to you Holy Spirit come move Holy Spirit we yield ourselves to you let your glory fall Holy Spirit Yield ourselves to you, Holy Spirit, to your rivers now, Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you, let your glory fall right now, Holy Spirit. We yield ourselves to you. Come glorify, come glorify Jesus now. Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you. Come glorify, come glorify Jesus now. Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you. Come glorify Jesus now. Let your rivers flow. Let your glory fall. Oh God, let your rivers flow. Let your glory fall. Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you. Come glorify Jesus now. Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you. Let your glory. Your rivers flow. Your presence be made known, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus.
I am yours and you are mine. Hallelujah. Sing it again. I am yours, Lord, and you are mine. Hallelujah. I'm in you Hallelujah. and you're in me. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. I am Father, we thank you that we can stand here boldly with the blood of Jesus, having washed us and cleansed us from every form of sin and iniquity. Father, we thank you for this wonderful work of redemption, for the power of the Holy Ghost. Father, we pray that only Jesus would be seen and revealed in every person's life that is standing here. Lord, that you alone would be that which is desired by the hearts of every person standing in this room, watching on the web or by YouTube, that there be not a single person that would want to live their own life anymore since you've given us yours. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you know, I'm glad you're standing in here this morning. I love being at the abiding place. I'm glad you're standing in here this morning. But really what counts is that in the not too distant future, you're going to be standing before the throne of God. It is an appointment. It is a divine appointment that God has set a date for each and every person. We were out working the other day and it was a lightning storm going on. And somebody, we had work to get done. Somebody said, oh no, this is bad lightning storm. These are the worst kind and this is the kind that creates all kinds of problems. I said, it's a good thing I know the one who forms the lightning. And I'm in his hands and his, his appointed time in my life is all that I need to be concerned about. And everybody calm down, hallelujah, because they are willing to follow the leader there in the situation. Somebody said, but don't tempt the Lord. I'm not. And it wasn't a demonic suggestion. It was a wonderful divine trust. Praise God. Yeah. You just, if you can learn how to just turn your life completely over to Christ Jesus and go ahead and let God the Holy Ghost teach you how to live in Him and walk in Him, then you'll have days of heaven on earth. Demonic powers, doctrines of devils, lying spirits that testify against the truth have been heeded by many men throughout the United States of America, the Western world especially, but the Word of God stands forever. The Holy Ghost isn't here to prove the Word. The Word of God proves the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit confirms the Word of God, you see? You know, a, a man, a, an older man of God once said, he said, you know, when we go out and we do ministry in other churches and other places, we're there to demonstrate the power of God. And there God uses us in special gifts and miracles and various different signs and wonders and but in the, in the church where we pastor, we teach people how to do it. And then, you know, I can go to a place that, you know, doesn't maybe have anyone who believes in signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of healing and, and the power of God being demonstrated in their life. Maybe they don't understand that Christ Jesus came and set them free and really liberated them. He liberated us more from the bondage and the tyranny of the, of the realms of darkness than Moses delivered Israel out of Egypt. 
Some people want to have a doctrine of Jesus Christ that has us, as it were, it would be, it, it, to, in comparison, you know what it would be like? It would be like Moses came to Egypt and told all the children of Israel, said, um, the Lord is going to deliver you out of the hands of, of the Egyptians and from your bondage and from your slavery. And that never happened. They just had somebody preaching to them. They all went to the meeting every Saturday or every Sunday. They all raised their hands and said, praise God, he's delivered us from Egypt. And back Monday morning, they went to making bricks in the mud pits of Goshen. No, that's not how it happened. Not how it happened. God brought a deliverer. His name was Moses. God brought a greater deliverer. His name is Jesus. And he came and he did a complete work of it for everybody who wants. There's people who have not decided whether or not they want God yet. There are many people who say they still love the wages of unrighteousness. Many people still love the influences and the emotions that they feel from demonic power called sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. They don't want to be delivered from it. They don't hate iniquity. They enjoy it. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. But Christ Jesus has come in His mercy to open up every person's eyes to deliver all mankind from darkness and from deception so that they can see how good it is to be in His presence where there's wonderful joy at His right hand where there are pleasures forevermore. There's a different kind of pleasure. There's a different kind of pleasure than the one that the demonic realm has taught man through the disobedience of Adam. But as God is greater than Satan, I, I, the obedience of Christ Jesus is greater than the disobedience of Adam. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so once again, I, I'm glad you're standing here, but I'm more concerned about how you stand before him. Because you have an appointed time and you have an appointed day. And it's the word of God that testifies whether or not you're acceptable unto God or not. People say, well, a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell. Well, listen to me, people send themselves to hell every day. Every day they make wrong choices and they live in disaster and upheaval. They do not live in heaven. They live in a torment. They live in destruction because God will not be mocked. You sow to the flesh and you shall let the flesh reap corruption, upheaval in your life. And anybody doesn't think that there is a hell on earth, you need to take a look around again and see. Now, I know some of you have been walking with God. You don't even know about that anymore because you live in days of heaven upon the earth. And that's the way it should be for all God's people because Christ Jesus is the doorway, allows us to access the presence of the Father and live there. And it's not some kind of fictional, you know, idea of something about, you know, what, what might happen to you in the future if you're good enough. It's what God has done for everybody who has simply put their trust in Christ Jesus, the name that is above every name. Father has made a way for you and I to live above the circumstances above the experiences, above the opinions of men, we can start believing the Word of God. You may be seated. You know, some people say, well, I don't know if I'm going to go to the meeting. They might be a false prophet. There might be a false prophet over there. I've discovered that men are the biggest false prophets to themselves. They shouldn't even have to worry about that. All day long, they're testifying about something that is contrary to God's Word. They're declaring curses over themselves. They're declaring bad things. They're declaring that it's going to get worse. They're declaring all things. They're declaring things that, that have nothing to do with the reality of having been born of the Spirit, washed in the blood, having been made sons of God, children of the Almighty, sons and daughters of the Most High, blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm, having been provided for according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Testifying all kinds of different things. So we want you to become a true prophet to yourself. And the way you become a true prophet is that you speak the word only. And you begin to live by the word. You know, Jesus defeated Satan in his greatest effort to destroy God's plan of salvation in the garden. And he came to him and he said, if you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. You know, Jesus just simply quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. You know, people they think that all the scripture in the Old Testament somehow isn't, isn't valuable anymore. It's still God-breathed Word of God. And Jesus used that to destroy everything Satan has. He just quoted Hebrews, forgive me. He just, he just, quoted, um, he just quoted 
Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 and said, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now you can say, well, I've not really been living this abundant life. And I'll say to you, well, you need to start living by the word. Amen. Because the life that the Lord Jesus is talking is about, about is, is, and that Deuteronomy is describing as a, as a life that is an abundant life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is the life of God. It's an eternal life. It's an undiminishing life. Somebody thinks that, well, it's just an eternity. It's basically a span of time. No, no, it's a quality of life. It's an unending, undiminishing life. And so we translate it in eternal life. And it does have an expense of time forever. But it isn't like people think about it. Because it's a quality of life as much as it is in a span of life. Huh? I'm going to tell you right now, I feel sorry for people who disobey God, refuse God, because they're spending eternity in a torment. In torment. It's a torment. Who wants that? That's an eternal life. The, it, hell eternally is an eternal life. If you just, many people, if they just had to live with their thoughts that they think every day, the worry, their concern, and that was all hell, and that's what they had to live. They just had to repeat, as it were, their life as they, it exists right now. That'd be hell, but it's worse than that. Satan is a rebel against God. He hates God, and he's created within this framework of his rebellion a realm in which he's able to attempt and draw men into the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, whose eyes are full and ultimately works to create a scenario where their eyes are full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. Satan's plan is to get people to a place where they cannot cease from sin. God, through Christ Jesus, came and bore our sins in his own body on a tree. That we now being dead to sin, dead, dead, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, just so that you can understand, maybe some of you think I'm just speaking my own words. These are the words of life. That we may, now being dead to sin, might live unto God. Might live unto righteousness. Hallelujah. Might live unto righteousness, by whose wounds we were healed. And then you look over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. You're turning quickly in your Bibles. I can see that, all of you. Because you're hungry for the Word. See, the Word of God will change everything. The Word of God will be a shield about you, just like His glory will be a shield about you. You know, when, when, the, when an enemy is coming out against your soul, the righteous like, are like a, a people who run in to a place of safety or a high tower. The name of the Lord is a strong and a high tower. The righteous run in and are saved. We run, for, we run to him for protection. Sin comes along, which is deception, which is demonic activity. See, men take pleasure in watching demon spirits work through other men. That's, where, that's why pornography is such a big thing. See, God said, I'll destroy that temple who defiles, I'll destroy that soul who defiles the temple of God, which you are the temple of God to those of you that have been born again. So that was actually to the, not to the world, but to the church, to his people who defiles their temple with fornication. Satan knows that, therefore he's got, all of his program is designed to destroy. And God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. God's word ultimately was made flesh. Everything that is described in his word was spoken out by one who is called the word. We call him the word because he's the definition, he's the proclamation, he's the revelation. He, he, he's every revelation of who God is. And he became flesh and he dwelt among us. Praise God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Of course, those of you who know scripture realize that I'm that, quoting John chapter 1 right there. Beginning about verses 1 through 3 and I also quoted verse 16. Hallelujah. You know, and, and so listen, I'm telling you something because I'm concerned about where you're going to stand on that day. People worried about, oh, it's the end of the world. I wouldn't worry about too much about the end of the world. I'd, work, I'd concern myself about your end. You need to concern yourself about your end. You concern yourself about the end of the world, it's just a distraction. Huh? But if you begin to understand, the Father's got something to say to you because He loves you so much. If you want to talk about, oh, I don't believe a loving God would send anybody to hell. Well, let me just tell you what. A loving God went through hell to redeem you from it. 
a loving God poured out all that he had through his only begotten son, the word, Christ Jesus, who bore our sin on the tree that we now being dead to sin might live unto righteousness, but whose wound we were healed. Let's just understand that God has made a way of escape. Now, because people want to refuse the way of escape and then point the finger of accusation and blame God, well, that's your problem. That's your issue. You chose. God went through a great, great sacrifice. God, as it were, you could say, risked all the universe, risked all of his creation to redeem you and me. And wants to show us the beauty of what it really means to live life instead of living in hate, living in lust. Huh? Give me a break. Somebody murdered you, you'd want justice. Or you uh, murdered the one that you love, you'd want justice. Somebody took your daughter and, and sold her into sex trafficking, you'd want justice. But yet you behold the, the product of that stuff. And you allow yourself to be enticed by it. Your emotions to be drawn into it. And your affections to be consumed by it. And say somehow God is just by condemning, by unjust because he condemns it. You need to think again. You need to think it through a little bit closer. Suddenly make God's judgments somehow impacting you directly because it's happening to that which you love dearly. That which you hold valuable. And that which you hold sacred. Suddenly you're going to have an entirely different opinion about what God defines as sin and is condemned and what God defines as righteousness and embraces. Because you want it too. And every man that has ever lived desires it. They just sit in a place of deception and try to isolate themselves because they're looking at someone that matters nothing to them and they're watching the operation or the function of demon spirits or somehow under an influence of a demon spirit in every form of sin, from thievery to lying to immorality. And somehow they make that okay. Well, it isn't. So God says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, He says, everyone who does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Do you see that? I said it again. It's not what some preachers preached. This isn't what some denomination came up with. It's what God said. He said, everyone who does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And everyone who practices goes on, continues in sin, wants it, desires it, is of the devil. Read it, verse, look at it, look at it, look at it. Hear it and read it. Because I'm concerned about where you're going to stand on that day. Father, so concerned about where you're going to stand on that day that he gave to you his only begotten son as a lamb that you can come and bring before his presence. A lamb that will wash you, cleanse you, make you a new creation. Not a substitutionary offering, not a vicarious offering, because that's not the scripture. The scripture says that we are crucified together with Christ. People come and they say that they're accepting Christ Jesus. All they do is accept a religion because they don't want to be delivered from sin. They just want to be just in their sin. They want to be right and okay with God while they continue in sin. There is no Bible, Genesis 1, 1, Revelation 22, 21, that even barely suggests that. I said to a verse the other day, I said, when you go to a doctor, do you listen to what the doctor tells you? Do you believe the doctor is telling you correctly, a medical doctor? And the person said, yes, I do. I said, well, I'm a doctor of the Bible. <laughs> Just like the doctor went and he spent a lot of time in school learning to tell you how your body functions. I went and spent a lot of time in school to tell you how your spirit functions, how your soul functions. From the word of God, not based upon the opinion of men, not something that somebody said, 5,000 years ago, not some kind of fictional idea about who God is, you know, developed by some group of people in Mesopotamia. But what God, the living word, Christ Jesus, who is the living word manifesting the written word. Every word of God is easy to understand. Just look at the living word manifested in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at him. He said, you want to be my disciple? Then you're going to have to understand you must... Take up your cross, deny yourself, and imitate me. Both in life and character. I mean, God, what God is, you know, the commandments of God. Here's the commandments of God. 
Come dwell in me, and I'll dwell in you. What a commandment. God says, come live my life, and I'll live through you. What a commandment. Now, people who don't want, who want to continue on in sin, people who want to live in a demonic realm, people who love the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam was a prophet. He knew God. But he loved the wages of unrighteousness. He wanted to have money and gain more than he wanted to have a relationship with the Lord and thought he could get away with it. You're not getting away with nothing. And nobody's going to get away with anything. You dirty, you're going to give an account for it. Huh? If you dirty through sin and you die in your sin, you're going, to, you're going to have a consequence for it. There is a law governing every day telling you you can't get away with it. I know on I-15, it seems like everybody gets away with driving over 65. And 70 when you get on up the road a little bit. Huh? Eventually they get caught. Every day you have a description to you that if you break the law, you are going to pay for it. Huh? Tell me, God, somehow, is it going to be a just judge and going to say to Sodom and Gomorrah, you judge, but to you, it's okay. I'm going to let you slide on this one. God hates diverse weights and measures. In fact, he would be an unjust judge if he did that. Somebody said, well, if God loves me. He's going to let me come into his heaven, be with him forever. No, if you got there doing it your own way, heaven, you turn heaven into hell then it ain't going to be any different from what it is right now in that realm. If men just get to come with all of their lies and their lust and their strife and their hate and their envy and their immorality and their demonic ungodliness, then heaven's hell. I'm so glad that that ain't the way it is. I'm so glad that it isn't, that isn't how it is. God and his love made a way for the dirtiest person to get cleaned up. I was in Cuba recently and, you know, we're having a, a meeting with pastors and leaders and supposed to, supposedly was the largest thing that's happened since 1959 or something like that, right, Cindy? I had to understand everything they said through her because my Spanish isn't that good. So if you want somebody, we'll just call on her to straighten it out. And I said, well, I come to Cuba not just to do... A, Mass Evangelism Crusade. I came to Cuba to get Fidel Castro saved because I don't want to be in heaven without him. <laughs> now listen to me, listen to me. That's what Jesus did. He came to get us saved because he don't want to be in heaven without us. Ain't he amazing? Yeah, all these preachers are looking at me like I said some bad word. <laughs> They're looking at me like I said some kind of false thing. Wait, hold up. How about you? How about you? Somehow are you more worthy of redemption than Fidel Castro? Praise God we had revival. Huh? One of, one of the men there, he's chief medical doctor in Havana, Cuba. He's also a pastor. Both him and his wife are both medical doctors and both pastors. And Papa broke him right there, man. Papa broke because they, you know, they lived under a, they lived under a dictatorship and an oppressive regime. They get 20 bucks a, a month, three eggs, what, and a half a pound of flour or something like that? You hear me? Yes. Come on, people, listen to that. But you can get all bound up with it. I said, no, I came to get Fidel Castro saved. We come, we come to meet with Fidel, hallelujah, and Ra Raul, who's going to be my buddy. <laughs> hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. They say Raul is the richest man on on. Planet Earth right now. He doesn't like it. I, I understand it when people say that. But he owns everything except for one person. Isn't it true? We, we, we are friends with the only other person in Cuba that owns land outside of Raul. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that wonderful? And that person's a Holy Ghost. Well, that family is Holy Ghost family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Full of the Holy Ghost. Take it a nation for Jesus. Thank you. I'm not willing to let Cuba remain in darkness. I'm not willing to let you remain in darkness. People in America want to believe in American gospel. Here's the American gospel. You get to continue on in your sin, enjoy your lust and your iniquity and evil, and then on that day, God's going to say, come on in, I love you, you righteous, holy thing, you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You did. You lived a life like I purposed you to live. Nobody believes that. 
you got to be deceived or completely insane, which are equivalent, to believe such a thing. Or you don't believe who God is. You've mixed him up with Satan. Satan would be happy to say that. There is a realm of rebellion and defiance against God. Everything that God has said and everything that God has purposed, there is a realm of rebellion that says, no, I will not do that. No, I will not be a part of it. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe I have to walk that, that, walk, walk that way, live that way. Huh? Look in Proverbs chapter 13. No, 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 no. Chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank, say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He redeemed my life from destruction. He ransomed me from death. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you right now. Let's look up at Aila Monpatea. Without the washing of his blood, I'm forever in prison to a, to a realm of rebellion, ever in prison to a place of destruction. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't like being around evil people. I don't like it. What do you call evil? I call evil what God calls evil. I don't like being around people talking bad about other people. I don't like to be around murderers. The only reason I get around dictators is to get them changed. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. 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 Praise God. <laughs> I don't like to be around evil people. I don't like to commune, commune with demon spirits, devils. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it on any form. On the television, on the radio, and coming out of a person's mouth. I don't, know, I don't want it. I'm over here and I love life. I love joy. I love love. I love peace. You know what? Everybody in here loves love, loves joy, loves peace. In fact, everybody on the planet loves love, loves joy, loves peace, but they're not willing to come into the ways of it. And nobody in their right mind wants to live in sorrow, sadness, oppression, pain, worry, misery, hate. No one. No one. Yet all the world lives in it. Nobody in their right mind would choose badness over goodness. Yet the world lives in badness. Huh? In the morning, just try to get off. Just try to, if you're over in the fast lane, just try to get off onto the exit. If you forget, of course, you're not going to forget. There's reminders coming right, left, and center. And you probably a person trying, hopefully not. Keep person from getting in front of you. Because you're, you're going to get to work a millisecond earlier. <laughs> Whatever, you know, it just, it just goes on. The insanity of it and the craziness of it just has no end. The Father's opened up the door so you and I can come into an abundant life. To live, what is an abundant life? It's to live His life. Yes. Jesus said it like this. He said, come and dwell in me. He said, I am the vine. You are the branch. My Father is the husbandman. Come live and dwell in me. It's the whole doctrine of sanctification is encapsulated right there in that, in that allegory. He said, if you live in me as a branch dwells in a vine, you bear forth fruit. If you don't bear forth the fruit that I demand, this life that I have given, then you should wither and you fall off and men should gather you together and throw you into the fire. You should be burned. Men, men. Because there's seducers, there's liars, people. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, wanting to be self-justified, self-righteousness, it's a powerful deception. You talk about, ah, oh, self-righteousness. Yeah, self-righteousness is to justify yourself in your iniquity, in your wrongdoing. Men do that. You do that. We can easily slip into that. We can all easily slip into that. Because as soon as we get into who did what, huh? Who said what? Who hit John? Whatever. It becomes all of this back and forth, and it's a self-justification. Well, it wasn't my fault. You did this because of your voice tones, because of the expression on your face, because of this. We always got a self-justification, a, ju a means by which we can somehow, you know, condone our, our wrong. I said to a person the other night, came to a meeting. I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and pray for you, get, blessed, get a blessing on you, get the power of God on you, even though you're an hour late for the meeting. And they proceeded to tell me they were an hour late for the meeting because they went to pick somebody up to bring them to church. I said, listen, man, I'm not going to get this blessing on you because your excuse is good. I'm putting this blessing. Nonetheless, I don't care whether it was a good reason or a bad reason. You are an hour late for the meeting. And that isn't the point. The point of it is, is I'm going to go after the power of God to see you get blessed and healed and touched by the, His presence right now. 
And Father never lets us down. Anybody who's willing to believe, I don't care how old you are in God, you can be two minutes old in God. One minute old in God. Huh? The fact of it is, soon, instantaneously, when you believe God, you participate with the greatest miracle. You do. Your own salvation. Hallelujah. Your own deliverance. Where you change, get a new heart, new spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> God puts the Holy Ghost in you. <laughs> I had to deal with a person not too long ago, and, and I, I, I came to them. And, you know, of course, when I've got to ask a person if they've asked Jesus to come in their life, you know, it's a pretty bad situation. Have you ever asked Jesus to come into your life? Oh, yeah. When did you ask Jesus to come into your life? Ah, oh, when I was six years old. I said, when did you surrender his, your life to him? She, and this person said, I surrendered my life to him when I was six years old. I said, so you've been fully living for God ever since. She said, yes. I said, no, you haven't. I said, you're not even right with God right now. Now, people are going to take that one of two ways. They're going to say, what do I need to do, get, do, to, do to get right with God? I think I get all uppity and try to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. But good thing of it is, is when God talks to somebody that way, it's because there's a willingness to respond. Because God won't talk to a person that way that's all arrogant, full of pride anyways. They're just going to die and go to hell because they've already made their decision. There are many people who, really, they're just in another religion. They come to a, tr a church called Christian. They have a Bible, rarely ever read it because if they read it, my goodness, it'd change them. You know what I'm saying? And then they want to this. everybody, you leave me alone. I know who I am. I've got a, I've got a, uh, you know, uh, an agreement with the man upstairs. First of all, there is no upstairs and there's no man there that has an agreement with you on your terms. There's the man Christ Jesus who demands that we agree with him. There is no agreement. He made the agreement. He made the covenant. There is no compromise. Compromise is demonic. God demands agreement. Compromise is Satan's game. All he's got to get, get you to do is just a little bit, just give a little bit to his suggestion, his way. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to open up a floodgate of destruction upon your soul. God's agreement. God's agreement. This is what his word says. This is what the Lord declares. Praise God, the anointing of the Holy Ghost was there. The power of God breaks off the strongholds. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I was in another situation. And uh, there was these worship leaders, you know, from a very large church. Yeah. Ann was there. She's smiling big time. And they all came and got in the prayer line. They made a mistake. Because all I'm doing, they, they, you can't, we, <laughs> we're the servants of the Lord. We're the ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to function in what God the Holy Ghost says. I just, I looked at the person. I said, where's your hunger? Where's the proof of your salvation? One of them was a very famous preacher's granddaughter. And they went on down the line. They all got all, all upset, crying, ah, right out of the place. Ah, he told us, he told us that we weren't hungry. Where's our relationship with God? The next night, they were busted by the power of the Holy Ghost. Busted. Latched onto me, wouldn't let go of me. I was feeling a little awkward. <laughs> Hugging on me. Wouldn't let go. God, the Holy Ghost, can find a little bit of room, a little bit of truth to work with. See, probably, well, I tell you what, I didn't talk to them about it, but I'll tell you what happened. They didn't sleep. <laughs> they didn't sleep all night. The man of God, with the Spirit, by the Spirit of the Lord, looked into their face and said, Where is your hunger for God? Where is your relationship with the Lord? They didn't sleep. Because it wasn't word of man. Was, huh? Yeah. They called up for counsel. <laughs> I mean, when your grandfather is one of the most famous preachers around in the, in the United States of America, you get some good counsel. Huh? And obviously, Grandpa said, You better listen. You better listen up. You better not run hide in shame. Because if what you have is real, let the floodlight shine upon it and let it be proven. Yeah. <laughs> if what you got in God is real, then the man of God can see it. Then the fruits of it will, bear, be, will be born forth and everybody will be able to observe it. I'll go hide in your shame. That's what Adam did. As soon as the voice of the Lord came, he ran and hid. And hid. 
tried to hide his sin, tried to hide his wrongdoing and his iniquity. Went all the time. Father's crawling. He said, no, 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 no. I'm not pointing this out to condemn you. I'm pointing this out to deliver you. Amen. I'm pointing this out. I've got a ransom for your soul. I've got a means of cleansing. I've got a, I've got a provision where you can come and have a relationship with me. <laughs> you want to be self-justified. The light came into the world and the light shined in darkness. Men sit in darkness, in gross darkness, separated from the glory of God. And here comes the light. And the light shines in the darkness. But the sad thing of it is, is men love sin. Men love sin. Therefore, they love darkness and they will not be reproved by the light. They retreat to their darkness. They retreat to their shadows. They come into the meeting and they lift their hands and as, as, as those that would worship God, as those that bring the offering that God requires. And the heart's far from them. Eh? The hardness of the heart has grown so thick, so calloused, that they can be involved in the depths of iniquity and stand there and praise Jesus for His love and mercy with no repentance. Such is the state of the American church. Is it your state? Because I'm, once again, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're standing in this place worshiping the Lord. But my job is all about your place and your soul when you stand before the living God in the very near future. And it's not about the end of the world. It's about your end. It's about you're going to give an account. And people say, well, I'm not so bad. I'm not interested in how bad or how good you are. I'm interested in whether or not you've been redeemed and your life has been changed and you've been given a new heart, a new spirit, and you love righteousness and you hate iniquity. And you're allowing the Holy Ghost to be your leader and be your guide and Christ Jesus to be your ruler. And His Word is the means by which He rules our life right now. And His Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of holiness, that calls within our heart a cry to go forth, to do Your will, O oh God. To do Your will, O oh God. Your will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, He's going to say to many on that day who said that they knew Him, He said, depart from me, you that work, you that practice it. Just as we referred to earlier in 1 John 3, 8. I do not know you. True. They never did the will of the Father. You go read it yourself. They never did the will of God. They never did the will. They continue on in the sin. God's come to deliver us from sin. It should be, it should be as good news as being delivered out of the mud pits of Goshen. Ah, yes. uh, from under the lash of the taskmaster. And the tyrannical reign of the oppressor should be, should be, should be, yeah, should be. But there's a prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, a spirit of disobedience that now works in the children of disobedience. That men have no understanding of and they're overwhelmed by it. They don't understand how to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And be able to stand with all the power of God, the strength of the Lord and the power of His might against all the spiritual wickedness that comes to war against your soul. Of course, you know, I just quoted a bunch of scriptures there, didn't I? If I, if I laid them out to you, it'd be six, uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 11. Um, be, uh, 1 Peter 3, what is it? 1 3, 3, 8. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. I mean, I know I should slow down more for people and give them all the verses of Scripture that we refer, refer to, but, you know, I just want to, I'm, I'm just driving home a point. You can go back. you got the best notes on this subject. The Word of God, just start reading the Word. Somebody said, I read the Word. Well, let's quit reading your favorite Scriptures and start at Genesis 1-1, read all the way through Revelation 22-21. Then when you've read that, start again. And about the 10th, 11th time, all of a sudden the Word of God is going to come up and slap you in the face and say, quit living like that. Huh? The Word of God is going to, going to strike your heart with the lightnings of God and say, you must change. Oh, yeah. Father has given us this riches and this treasure and this blessing. He's given us this means to be <laughs> in every way matured and growing and, and, and developing in all the demeanor and character of His glory and His 
beauty and his majesty. But we've got to be willing to desire the sincere nourishment of the word. People become fat to do iniquity. They become fat. They sit at the table of lust. And that will destroy any hunger for the word. Because it's a satanic stronghold. That will in every way display to you by all the various different indicators that you do not have a relationship with Father. Because the Spirit of the Son cries, Abba, Papa. Abba, Abba, Father. Huh? The Spirit of the Son loves the Word of God, to live in the Word of God, devour the Word of God, to live by the bread of heaven. Hallelujah. As a daily diet. Praise God. Finding all of our communion and fellowship in the precious blood of redemption that has purged, erased, removed every sin. Hallelujah. And you love it that way. I love purity. I love purity. You'll love it too on that day. I love righteousness. You'll love it too on that day because no righteousness, no purity, no acceptance by the Father. Period. This is the Word of God. It isn't the testimony of men. It is not the doctrine of the 21st century as we advance the apostasy with seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, giving more attention than the Word of God. But there's no man who can say somehow that he didn't have an opportunity because the Word of God has never been made so available to man as it is now in these last days. I believe that God allowed computers to be invented just so we could study the Word more thoroughly. I got total silence. If I were... <laughs> wow, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Woo! Yo! I'll go ahead and be the minister in the audience too. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what your silence is about, but I pray that your voice will begin to be heard in heaven. Yeah. I don't know what you're silenced about, but I pray that your voice will begin to be heard in the earth. Because you, the representative and the minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe I touched on a soft spot with you. Not a soft spot, a bad spot. Maybe that's not what computers are for you. Huh? Maybe that's not what all these technology is for you. It means by which now you can be more involved in what God is doing. But let it be. Are you in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you what, you disagree with me? You get your computer, you get your search engine. I won't use a computer and I won't use a search engine. And you can sit there and you can use all the scriptures you want. You can get everyone you get out, get everyone, bring them. And we'll just have a discussion in God. Because I'll take every verse of scripture that you throw at me that somehow justifies sin and iniquity and I'll prove to you by that verse of scripture and all the ones that you bring up that what you're saying is invalid. Happy to do it. Why? Because we want to argue with people? No, because we're concerned about where you stand with Jesus. Amen. About where you're going to stand on that day. Because we know that many false doctrines and many false prophets have gone out into the world seducing spirits. And, and the reality of it is, is that we're supposed to try the spirits. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of God. And every spirit that doesn't confess that we overcome the world is not of God. Because those two are linked together in 1 John chapter 4. Verses 2 and verse 3 and 4 are linked together. They're inseparable. To say that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh and that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That's why we've overcome them. Yes. There's nothing more important. Jesus said, you overcome like I overcome. If you don't believe what I'm saying, just read the expression and the address of the Lord Jesus Christ to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 1 through 3. And just look at it. He says, listen, I've tried you. I've seen, how, I've seen that your works are perfect, but I have somewhat against you. Repent. Oh, I blot out your name. Now, fit that into your doctrine. Just go fit what Jesus... People think that Jesus is a lowly lamb of, Cal, uh, of Galilee. And you just, oh, you know, easy touch. Just go with whatever it is that you're doing. Just facilitate you like an accommodating mother. You're listening to me. 
No, he stands in the midst of his church with his eyes, a flame of fire, and it's a jealous flame. You go and look at him there and you compare him to Daniel chapter 7. What is it? Verse 8. Compare the look of Jesus standing there lit up with glory with his priestly and his kingly garments upon himself and out of his mouth coming a sharp two-edged sword and he's saying, you repent and you get right or I will come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. And he's talking to his churches. Hello. I'm interested where you're going to stand. I'm, I'm right now dealing with false doctrines and lies that people have developed around Christianity that are nothing more than deceptions that ensnare men's souls. And anybody can escape it. All you got to do is quit living your life in a world, come out from among them, be separate, says God, touch not the unclean thing, and I shall receive you, and then I will be your God and you'll be my people. Amen. Having these promises, therefore, dearly beloved, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, for without holiness no man shall see God. Now you know all the verses of Scripture I just quoted, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Oh, forgive me, 15 through 17. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 1. And Hebrews chapter 12, what is it? 14. Four, verse 14. If I'm delivering to you the Word of God in context, then you have, your problem isn't with me. Your beef is not with me. Your problem is with God. Because all I am is His messenger. All I am as a faithful messenger, not even declaring to you what He's revealed to me personally, but declaring to you what He said very clearly in His Word so that you can go read it. His Word, will, His Word is a fire. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. It'll burn up the chaff. Yes. It's a hammer to bust the rocks. Amen. We're getting ready to go. I'm getting ready. And I get about five in the morning. We're going to go do the camp meeting, Northwest Camp Meeting Conference. Just so blessed to be able to do it. So honored to be able to do it. And when we there, we'll bring out the hammer. Amen. The hammer. Amen. And if the hammer wasn't big enough for the first night, we'll get a bigger hammer. And by the third night, I guarantee you, if the hammer, the bigger hammer wasn't good, big enough, before we go in, we'll just bring some nukes. <laughs> Throw it in. <laughs> let it blow up. In the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Ghost. And then we'll just walk in and watch God do the work. Amen. This, is, this is what he does. Yes. He wants to deliver you and, and everybody who's entrapped yes. with lies and doctrines of devils that produces wrong living. Because if you don't live by the word, if you don't agree with the word, you're never going to have the miracle that the word describes. If you don't believe that Jesus opens up the eyes of the blind, you'll remain blind. If you don't believe that he can make the cripple walk, you remain crippled. If you don't believe that he'll make a new creation, you're going to remain an old creature. You're, you're going to remain a child of the devil. People say, well, I thought everybody was a child of God. No, you've got to be born of God to be a child of God. Yes. Amen. People, even in the right religion, John chapter 8, and even in the right religion of the day, the Pharisees, you know, the Pharisees were, <laughs> Pharisees were, that whole group, they were started, it was started by Ezra. You ever read Ezra? Huh? Started by Ezra and Nehemiah. Did you know that? Did you know that? He, ca he called everybody together who would tremble at the word of God. That's he's the tremblers. Huh? That's what we, we call Pharisees. The Haradim. The tremblers. He said, you, here's the tremblers that Ezra and Nehemiah started. You know, Nehemiah, who went and got after him, here's his pastor away. <laughs> He curses them, beats them, pulls out their hair. True. You didn't read that verse scripture? It's true. Yes. Nehemiah chapter 13, what is it? 14, verse 14, 15. Huh? I just like to have pastor like that. They liked it. He was delivering them from evil. He was. He did. Nobody could come in here and get their hair jerked out today. They're the people of God. They want to be delivered from their evil. Yes. And they couldn't run to another pastor. That's the only one they had. <laughs> if it wasn't for Nehemiah, they wouldn't even be in there. They wouldn't even be back. And the priests are standing behind Nehemiah going. <laughs> the 
The priests and Levites. What is it? Ne what, ne is it? what scripture is that? Nehemiah 13, what is it? Huh? Yeah, 1325. Thank you, sir. Always love people who got the word of God right there. That's where it's supposed to be. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. The psalmist. Now, Christ Jesus, the living word, is dwelling inside of me. Hallelujah. How much more do I have an authority not to sin against him? Are you listening to yes. me? I mean, come on. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. God dwells on the inside of you if you've been born again. Think about it, people. Think about God dwelling on the inside of us. Come on. Listen, this is what God said. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, what is it? Verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 again in 1 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, what is it? 15. Correct? All says you, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Four verse scripture right there says you, the temple of the Holy Ghost. And then there's, so, there's, there's a hundred more that implies it. That God the Father dwells in you. God the Father who dwells in the holies of holies. A preacher's daughter in 1880 wrote a song. It became a very popular song up until the apostasy started advancing in the 60s. It's a very popular song before the 60s. Take my heart, take my will, and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is your own. It shall be your royal throne. Think about that. It shall be your royal throne. Take my heart, it is your own. It shall be your royal throne. We had Holy Ghost, they had Holy Ghost meetings back then. See, John could say, we know that everyone who is born of God does not sin. I have to say, they knew. I'm quoting 1 John 5, 18. They knew everyone who is born of God does not sin. They keep themselves and the devil cannot touch them. They knew it. We don't. Because in advancing of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And men running around saying, oh, we're all unrighteous. We're all professional sinners. That, there can be nothing more that would personify as a demon doctrine than that when God says over 500 times and to, uh, that we are either declaring to us that we are being made righteous or demanding that we live in righteousness. Amen. For with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Well, if you don't, if you say, no, my mouth confesses that I'm not saved, that we're still all in this world, and my heart believes that I'm still unrighteousness, then that is antichrist spirit. That, by definition, is antichrist spirit. It is the opposite. It's the antithesis. Romans 10, 9 and 10. One of the cornerstones, if you would, of what we would call or describe salvation to be when we're leading a sinner to repentance. Huh? Yeah. True. For if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, men believes unto unrighteousness. No, it's people taking verses of Scripture out of Psalms 5 and twisting them and misapplica misapplications of Romans chapter 3 concerning the incurable wound of sin and iniquity in Israel. And we saw what happened to them in the judgment of God, saying there's none righteous, there's none who does, who does good, there's none who follows after God. Job was righteous. Yes. Noah was righteous. I break it down right there. Isaiah and the psalmist were talking to a specific generation at a specific time that the Lord said, Now, seeing you should not see, hearing you should not hear, neither shall you understand with your heart, lest you should be converted and I should heal you. A judgment that, Jesus, that Isaiah finalized, that Jesus then validated, verified, and then when he was alive, Matthew chapter 8, and then you hear Paul re-enunciate at the end of his ministry, what, Acts 26 or Acts 28? Which one is it? You are just like your fathers, the prophets. Just like your fathers, as the prophet said. You always resist the Holy Ghost. Huh? Seeing, not, seeing you cannot see, hearing you cannot hear. Neither see you understand with your heart, lest you be converted and I heal you. People, what am I talking about? You're standing with God. How easy is it to be redeemed? 
So easy. Call upon the name of the Lord. Look for a Savior. You want to be delivered from the sin. You don't want to be delivered from the consequence of the sin, the judgment. You want to be delivered from the torment, the influence, the power of it that demands you to be a slave to it. Yes. That demands you to commit acts of treason against the Most High. You, can you hear what I'm saying? Yes. Proverbs 17.3. The silver, it rather, forgive me, the refiner's fire is for the silver and the furnace is for the gold. But the Lord both assays, tries, and purifies the heart. Now listen, the Hebrew word is behan, behan. And it is a word that joins together the first phrase, okay? Refiner's fire and furnace for the gold. And another Hebrew word not mentioned in the verse of Scripture that not only tests it or assays it to see how pure it is, but then purifies it so that it is everything that you would be happy to own. Huh? How many of you like 10% gold? Not as much as 99%. Father tries and purifies the heart. Go with me quickly to Psalms 24, 3. Of course, you can quote it, can't you? You can quote it, can't you? Yes. See, thy word, if I hit, your word, if I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Huh? The word came into me. Christ Jesus came into me. If you don't believe that Christ Jesus came into you, you're not even in the faith. We, but Paul says this in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, 28. He said, this is the, he describes to us the faith and the, the power of the faith, the mystery of the fellowship, Christ in me. My confidence of glory. Just as he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But I don't live. It's not me living. It's Christ that lives. The call for you and I to live the life of God. Well, why does that sound bad to some people? Because you're in prison to sin and iniquity. You're blinded by the deception of hell. But you know what? You're in a good place today, whether you're here or whether you're watching by the web, because God gave us power to take you from the power of Satan into the power, his power, the power of God. To bring you out of darkness into light. Now, whatever you, your light's shining right now. Power of God's here. You can fight him if you want. You can run high and tell God why and blame Eve. Or you can say, Lord, I want your salvation. Lord, I want your redemption. I'm going to respond to you. Yes. Yes. Jesus. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Because that's the response you're supposed to have. Just in case you missed the response of the psalm. Who shall stand in the hill of the Lord? The response is, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? The response is, who shall stand in his holy place? The refrain that everybody has, they that have clean, that everybody does together in unison, they that have clean hands and a pure heart. He purified my heart. People said, oh, we got a wicked heart. Wait, you misunderstood Jeremiah 17, verse 6. You misunderstood. He said very clearly, Jehovah's premise of Jeremiah chapter 17 to begin with is, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord the sole object of his trust. Okay? He's going to be blessed in all of his doing. Cursed is the man who trusts in the arm of flesh. Huh? And he says that the heart of man is frail and weak. He doesn't even use the word, either, any, not not ra, not any other Hebrew word for wickedness. It's not used. It's not even used. And then people go and take a misapplied verse of Scripture from the Old Testament try to make a New Testament doctrine out of it when the Lord says we purified our souls in obedience unto the truth. When He says He's given us the covenant is a new heart, a heart just like His, a new heart and a new spirit, which is a holy heart and a holy spirit. Give me a break. And the only people that are going to stand in His presence anyway have a pure heart. So how about all these people who believe that their heart's impure? Well, you got the wrong faith, man. It's called antichrist faith. I don't care. I don't care. 
doesn't matter to me if the entirety of the world stands as a church community and says, no, it's not true. We all have a wicked and an impure heart. They wrong, because every man's a liar and God is true. Amen. What God has said is absolutely true. When we, be, when we recognize that Christ Jesus has come to dwell in our, the tabernacle of our heart, in the tabernacle of our very being. Hello. Amen. I'm going with God's word. Amen. The fact of it is, is everybody can prove this. Everyone can prove this. Somebody said, well, if it's provable, why don't you hear more of it? That's a good question. It's an, it's, and it's a reasonable question. The reality of it is, is the entire theological and scholarly community says this is the word of God, but it's not our experience. Well, how, what kind of argument is that? There's no argument. Your experience now is the proof of the word of God? No, your word, the word of God is supposed to be the proof of your experience. I can't help it that people are stuck in lay theology. A lay theology that has a, a, a heritage that doesn't go back very far. That has a genealogy that doesn't go back very far in terms of the doctrines of the church. Because it wasn't long ago and everybody knew, I don't care what denomination you were in, I don't care what denomination you were in, that God demanded a holy life and righteous living. Every church, every denomination. Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic. Even Pentecostals. <laughs> Which is the holiness movement. Came out of the Methodist Church, the Methodist holiness movement. Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene, Methodist movement. Ha, huh? Azusa Street, Pentecostal movement from which the Church of God and the Assemblies of God became distinctive. Holiness movement. All a bunch of Methodist preachers for the most part, some Presbyterians and others, but for the most part, People hungry for God, hungry for the, the life and the power and the glory of Jesus Christ to be manifested in their life and through their life. The apostasy is advanced. If you haven't read your Bible, there is an apostasy that the world is moving fast towards, which is one of the first signs that we're in the last days. One of the first signs that we're in the last days isn't that Trump is going to be elected president or Hillary is going to be elected president. That's not one. Or that... You know, Israel became a nation. That's not one. It's a, an indicator. It's, a, it's an indicator. The bigger indicator is the temple being built in Jerusalem. That's the bigger indicator because that's what it's all about. It's not about Israel becoming a nation. It's about the temple being built in Jerusalem. Right now, Israel is a secular nation. They don't want to be a religious nation. They would say, what do you want us to be like Iran? We're a secular nation. So over 70% of people in Israel do not want a temple built. And it would have to, the landscape, of, the landscape would have to change. Muslims believe it's their third most holy site. So long as they've got power, and they're, they're not losing the third most holy site. Huh? The UN is backing up the fact that it has to remain a neutral zone. So somebody said they ca Israel captured Jerusalem in 1967. Big deal. They still haven't had the right to do anything with Temple Mount. It's all about Temple Mount. You're listening to me. Yes. We've got all these various different ideas that people go, you know, fantastically, you know, pursuing. And then you get a good orator up and then they really work the system because they're a great salesman. And then they got you hanging over the edge of your seat thinking that tomorrow Jesus is going to come. And everybody runs to the altar, does whatever it is that they're supposed to do and goes on living their, their normal life. Give me a break. Let's preach the truth. Let's get a real heart change. Let's understand what God's saying. One of, the, one of the primary signs is seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, lying to people and deceiving people and people becoming lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Hello. Do you have clean hands? Do you have a pure heart? Purity, purity is wonderful. Did you know that purity is one of the fruits that you have the Holy Ghost? Did you know that you're not born again unless you have the Holy Ghost? Did you know that? Did you know that? Hallelujah. Did you know that, and let, that the Holy Ghost is proof that you've been born again? And that there's pr proofs of the Holy Spirit is this equivalent to fruits. 
And you can look, for example, not only in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, 23, but also just you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, and you can see there, now give all diligence, where we're, we're looking at giving all diligence to making our calling and election sure. You look, and God says, listen, you're without excuse. By my own divine power, I've given you everything that you need that pertains to my life and my godliness because I've called you to my glory and to my purity. Did you know that the Lord says for you to be pure even as he's pure? Did you know he told you to be righteous even as he's righteous? Did you know he told you to be holy even as he is holy? Did you know that he told you to walk even as he walks? Did you know that he told you to live in him and abide in him and he'll live in you and abide in you and that's the terms of the covenant? Why is it then if we're not approaching seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and we're all really got the message that you're not hearing that message even though we've got so much of the media supposedly declaring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, the gospel is supposed to be good news. Praise God, we've been liberated. We're no longer in bondage to sin and darkness but have been brought into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Hallelujah. I said brought into the glorious liberty. I said brought everything that pertains to life and godliness. Hallelujah. Now he says, that's verse, and that's verse three. That's verse three. And he's just getting warmed up. He's just getting warmed up. Because he's saying, seeing as you, whoo, seeing as you've been made partakers of the divine nature and you've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That is a mouthful right there. Verse 4, will change your whole doctrinal perception. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, will change your whole doctrinal perception. God will not accept you as you are. He will not. He says it again and again. He will not accept you as you are. He will change you to be like him. But you've got to want that. God loved Moses, but he said, Moses, don't you come near me. Look at it. What is, what is that, Exodus 6? Don't come near me. This is holy ground, you other than me. Now the Lord says to us, come on in. Come behold. Come look. Whoever wants. He said, peace to those who are near and peace to those who are far away. He says, come on into the fellowship. He's he opened up the door that we can come with the, with, by the blood of Jesus into the holies of holies, not the one that was in the tabernacle that could only be entered in once a year by a high priest anointed with a specific ability to do so. But anyone everyone. Hello. Yeah. Oh, God's just going to accept. No, he's going to give you an opportunity to be changed yes. so you can be like him. Yes. He'll call you like you are. Yes. He will call you. But God accepts no man's person. God will not accept strange fire. Ask Nadab and Abihu. That's right. yep. And I got many more. Leviticus chapter 16 will get you warmed up. Are you listening to yes. me? Because this is the doctrine of God. This is his doctrine. And then the first thing he says to us after he tells us that we've been made partakers of the divine nature, praise God, that's pretty good, ain't it? I say, that's a pure heart. I say, that's clean hands. I say, that's purified. Are you listening? If you haven't believed the truth and obeyed the truth, think about this. If you haven't believed the truth and obeyed the truth, then your heart's not been purified. That's what you've, you've purified your souls through obedience unto the truth that resulted in pure love one for another. Wow. Man, if we could just live these few verses of Scripture right here. That, what, that's just Peter's doctrine. Was, I gave you 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, and then I just gave you that verse Scripture. What is that? That's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, isn't it? See, you've obeyed, huh? See, you've purified your souls by obeying the truth, huh? Is that right, everybody? Because you know the Word of God, right? It's in you. It's in your heart. Huh? Huh? Are you listening to me? Yes. What is it? Come on, guys. Quickly. Quickly, come on. Quickly. Chapter 2, verse 25. Where is it? 26? Just, just give me the verse. Verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. You've got to get this. Because if you believe the wrong thing, it ain't going to work. Somebody said, I believe the wrong thing. It was my fault. <laughs> yeah, it is your fault. Because <laughs> you have preachers preaching. Hallelujah. And now you've got Bibles, search engines. I mean, everything. It's your fault. Because now, all of a sudden, you've not obeyed the gospel. You've not purified your soul through obedience to the truth. Your souls remain unpure because you've not believed the truth. You believe a lie. The Lord says they'll believe a lie. There's a... There'll be a spirit of strong delusion and they'll be able to leave a lie and be damned. The lie brings into bondage. The truth sets free. Jesus says, you know the truth and the truth sets you free. I think I'm going to get my Bible out and read a verse of scripture. 
I'm going to get your Bible out. Do you have your Bible out? Everybody's got the electronic media. That's fine. I heard a person complaining. Everybody's got electronics now in church. It just isn't right. What's wrong with it? I can't help it that you made the computer the mark of the beast. I'm going to tell you right now, it's far worse than that. It's far worse than that. It is to be in, that, that thing is going to be the most evil act of worship that is impossible, impossible to be forgiven. People already got the mark of sin on them. They're already marked by sin. I see people marked by sin all the time. Same beast, same devil. It's just that he's, in the future, he's going to be revealed with power on a level that none can resist him. Hmm? He give power to overcome the saints. So as scripture says, Revelation chapter 12. Okay, I'm closing with this. I'm getting my Bible out. Whew. Where should I go? Where am I going? Anybody got the word of knowledge? That's a good way to practice the word of knowledge. I love practicing the word of knowledge. The best way to practice the word of knowledge is through scripture. Okay, just, you know, something that comes to your heart, you know, then just let God just begin to, just begin to speak out the word of God. Hallelujah. Oh, that's word of knowledge anyways. That's the knowledge of God. So, so Psalms 15. If you, if you were thinking Psalms 15, one, you're right. <laughs> Psalms 15, one. Yes, it's awesome, baby. All the righteous are glad. The righteous shall they hear thereof and be glad. Huh? The people who don't want to change shall be sad. For they will recognize that they're not in the group, that they're not a part of the number. Thus they shall persecute us and try to condemn us unto death that they may be justified in their own iniquity to ultimately live out the rest of their life and die and go to a place of eternal destruction. Terrible, terrible consequence to rejecting the truth. But this is the ways of God. Listen, the reality of it is, it's not the many, it's the few. That's what Jesus said. Broad is the way to destruction. Many go there on, go thereby. Narrow is the way that leads into life. There's few there. He said, they're gonna, they, if, they're gonna, if they're gonna persecute the prophets, stone the prophets, saw the prophets in half, and they're going to say that I'm speaking to you by demon spirit. What are they going to say about you? He says, a servant is not above his master. And if I think that somehow I can live a different kind of life than Jesus and have Jesus' results, I believe that I'm above my master. I'm not, and neither are you. It's about time for you to repent. Get right with God and get the leaven out of your life and you'll have heaven. Get deal with the sin and say, I don't want it. It's not going to be in my life. Quit justifying sin. Get rid of it. It's not going to be in my life. You be conformed to the image of Christ, Jesus, the Son. That's what God has predestinated you to be. Romans 8 and 29. God has predestinated you to be conformed in every way to the image of the Son. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transfigured by thinking different about yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans 12, 2. I'll just go on like this all the rest of the day. Happy to do so, if it'll change you. But some of you, I'm fighting with you over your soul. I'm fighting. It's amazing. I go different places, all over the place, fighting with people over their soul. It's easier to reach Hindus than Christians. It's easier to reach Buddhists than Christians. It's easier to reach Muslims than Christians. That's why Jesus said, if that light which is in you be darkness, oh, how great is that darkness? It was easier for Jesus to reach a Syrophoenician than to reach the people of his own family, the Jews. Because they believed they were right. Bless God. I'm right and you're wrong. Jesus standing in front of them and he said, you, could just, you are the devil. You're a false prophet. It's just the way it works. God's word is power and authority. God's word created everything that is in heaven and earth. God's word speaking forth to create in you right now. All of God's looking for someone who will obey and believe him. Yes, 
saw Papa's looking for. Psalm 15, 1. Lord, who should abide in your tabernacle? I'm very interested. Because I'm, I'm going to be there. Yeah. Me too. Huh? I'm not, I, I, I don't care what it cost. And the cost isn't that great. The cost is say no to death and yes to life. The cost is simply say an equivalence. People all accept, is all excited about saying no to death. But sin is death. The way to sin is death. They equal. The doctrine of Romans chapter 5 is all about that death entered by sin. And sin produced death. And Romans, the doctrine of Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 21, establishes sin and death to be equivalent. Praise God that when we, those of us who have been born again, we no longer under the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. 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 For those of us who walk not after the flesh, human ability, or the realms of the world and the spirit of the world, but we walk after the spirit. Hallelujah. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm in him and he's in me. I'm in him and he's in me. So can you say it? I'm in him and he's in me. That's what you've got. You have to understand that. You've got to say, you can't just, as this girl said, oh, I've been walking in the fullness of God. I said, you've got to be kidding me. No, you haven't. Now I'll prove it to you right now. So Mr. Jesus says, can't you just let people go like that? No, I can't. No, I would have broke down. You've been walking in the fullness of God. You're the tabernacle of God. You've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You're walking in the, in the Spirit. Christ Jesus is your sovereign ruler. You live only by Him. Why are you standing there pregnant out of wedlock? I mean, because we bring it down. You know, we just go ahead and bring it down. I mean, we're just polite about it. We whisper some things in people's ears. Why is it that you did shh, shh, last night? Well, how did you know that? Because Papa's here. Hello, God who tries the hearts. This isn't just fictional Christianity. This isn't some kind of, you know, esoteric belief that has no real substance to it and proof. This is the reality. Come try to lie to God. One day, very near future, you're going to stand before him and you're going to give an account for your soul, for your behavior, your deeds, your actions, your response to him, to his so great a salvation. What he did for you when he poured out the blood of his only begotten son at Calvary, what he did for you when he poured out the most sacred treasure to himself, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness. And then you're going to stand there and tell Father why you were, lived in unforgiveness, why you lived in offense, why you lived in bitterness, why you lived in envy, why you lived in strife, why it is that you lived in sin and iniquity of all these various different sorts and couldn't quit doing it because it was just too good. No, he said, I'll give you change. No, I'm going to wait for you to have a change of heart because it would be too bad to do it. And God, the Holy Ghost, it, it is so wonderful because it doesn't matter how much you fail, how much you sin. If you don't want to sin, if you don't want it in your life, there's the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you. Amen. Isn't it amazing? Because you want to be taught righteousness. And I guarantee you, you're going to make some headway. You're going to be like that 30 years from now. Huh? Because he leads us in the paths of righteousness. No, he leads us in the paths of unrighteousness. No, he leads us in the paths of righteousness. We're going to say, I heard some people there give this thing on TV. They're talking about how we all unrighteous. And no, none, none, none does good. No one seeks God. And they're going on and on about the unrighteous. And then they're getting ready to make, the, they're going to make a, a pitch for an offering. And, and so they're talking about how that God is, that God is the provider. And by the way, the righteous have never been forsaken. But you just spent an hour telling us that they're none righteous. And now you're going to make a pitch for an offering and to start invoking the blessing of God upon the righteous. Somebody needs to think about, think it through a little bit more. Somebody needs to think. And reality of it is once again, you got a search engine, you look in your search engine, type in righteousness. What's going to come up about 557 times, I believe it is. 557 times will come up. Righteousness. Either God declaring that that's what he's made us or demanding that we be that yes. and live that way and walk in that way. Now, why is that so sad to people? 
To me, it's liberation. When God says, be holy even as I am holy, I'm like going, woo, I get to. Because it's an empowering word. When God said to Abraham, he said, I am El Shaddai, or I am the sovereign almighty. Walk before me and be perfect. You didn't see Abraham going. He's just expecting too much. No, he was empowered by the word that was spoken to be that. God said, be light and light was. Hallelujah. 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 He says, be holy, and holy is. No, I mean, this is, the, this is the doctrine of the Word of God, and especially if you look at it from the Hebrew language. He, this is the empowerment of God. He declares it to be. Of course, creation doesn't resist. It responds and is. I started to quote it to you in Hebrew and try to explain it to you, but I make everybody's eyes cross, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> the Lord just says, be, and it was. Be, and it is. Be holy. Even as I'm holy. What? He didn't say, be holy as the priest Aaron is holy. He didn't say, be holy as Paul is holy. He didn't say, be holy as your uncle Joe is holy. He said, be holy even as I'm holy. What a presidents. What a holiness. Then people look to themselves, Dharma flesh. How am I going to do this? No, no, no. He empowers it. He empowers this. He empowers this purity. If you don't want it, now you're going to get under condemnation because you don't want it. I don't want to be that way. I don't want to change. Because it's going to be radical change. Radical change. Crucified with Christ, buried with him by baptism into his death. You, death, you really dead. Your life's over. Raised up together with them, people want to have, hey, looky, I hear people say, oh, I'm dying, you know, I'm just trying to put it to death. Well, you don't even got a scripture for that. I mean, the closest thing that you've got is Paul said, I protest that you're rejoicing, I die daily. And he was talking about the fact that they said that they were already raised from the dead. From re with a resurrected body. So that would be a misapplied verse of scripture. And that's the only one you can grapple for. Because there's, no, there's not another one. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I'm dying. No, he didn't say nothing about dying. He said deny. Amen. He said deny yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, I didn't do anything of myself. I did only what the Father told me to do. I'll show you. I'm the living word showing you how to live by the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Deny yourself. Come be taught of God. Amen. As many as led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And be certain of this. As many as are not led by the Spirit, they're not the sons of God. And you're going to tell me that the Holy Ghost is going to lead you in hell? He's going to lead you in heaven. He's not, he's not going to lead you into your own life. He's going to lead you, in life of, lead you into the life of Jesus. And he begins by just teaching us the word. We say, oh, this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to bless them to curse us. We're supposed to be do good to those who despitefully use us and say all manner of evil against us falsely. And he just goes on and tells us how to behave ourselves. He tells us to live in purity. He said, be holy even as I am holy. Be, be righteous even as I am righteous. Be pure even as I am pure. And I'm going, beautiful. And he, he, says, he even says, as he said to Abraham, be perfect. And Jesus would go, be perfect just like I'm perfect. He said, be perfect just as the Father in heaven is perfect. Just like he said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm El Shaddai. I'm God sovereign, the sovereign almighty. Walk before me and be perfect. And somebody said, what does that mean? I perfectly follow him. I want him. I want his way. I want heaven. I want, his, I want his life. I want his love. I want his, I want his love so bad that if all of a sudden I feel like getting, you know, into some realm of hate, I'm going to say no to that. I'm, I'm going to say no to it. I'm going to say, Holy Spirit, come fill me. I'm going to let go, God the Holy Ghost take control. And I'm going to have the fruits of the Spirit that I've been born again. I'm going to have love there. And, I'm going, and as I was saying before in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, now I'm going to give all diligence to making my calling election sure. And I'm going to add unto my faith purity. And to purity, I'm going to give knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, self-control. When you've got self-control, you can deny yourself. If you don't have it, you can't do it, right? Guess what? God, the Holy Ghost, is going to supply that because it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? Yes. Are you, everybody with me? You understand that? 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I'm just teaching the word. I'm just here. We, we, you thought you'd come in a little Sunday school meeting? This is, I'm telling you right now, we're, just going, we're talking to you. This is the word of God meeting, a Holy Ghost meeting. To get you changed, to get you walk up, get up out of here, and you have confronted God and the call of God upon your life. You confronted the word, both written and living. The living word, Christ Jesus, who expresses, Lo, behold, I've come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. In other words, he came in the full volume and expression of the Bible. And it was all about him. What were you going to do with Jesus? Pretty soon you're going to stand before him. Oh, a dear friend of mine, great man of God, great man of God. Signs and wonders and miracles. Mighty in word and deed. Mighty in word and deed. God used him to make millions of dollars. God used him in signs and wonders and miracles and evangelism and crusade. He didn't make millions of dollars through offering baskets. He made millions of dollars through business. His business. Running wide open. I was trying to tell him to slow down. First of the year, his heart exploded. He couldn't get to the hospital in time. Signs and wonders. Deaf heard. Crippled walk. Blind saw. Great miracles. Signs and wonders. But his heart exploded. His day, was, his day was called into account. I said, Lord, no, 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 no. We need him. We need him. Because many have sat around and watched the few do the work. We only have a few that run into doing what Jesus said to do anyways. To go in all the world and preach the gospel. To make disciples out of nations. We don't have a few doing it. Everybody else attended to their own business. We're going to see that changed. We're going to see that changed. God's changing that. Hey, Papa, I'm going to preach on that tonight. Oh, I'm going to preach on that. It's going to be powerful. You want to come? Signs and wonders and miracles. Quick advertisement for tonight. God, the Holy Ghost will be here. God, Christ Jesus will be here. I was, I was in Kashmir just recently, and the taxi cab driver in Kashmir said, you know, Christians and Muslims, we all serve the same God. And I said, Lord, what, how am I going to answer this guy? And I said to him, I said, that is amazing. I had no idea that Jesus Christ was the Muslim God. Christians are sitting around theologians, not theologians, lay preachers sitting around trying to figure out that whether the Muslims have the same God as the Christians and the Jews. My God's name is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's God. Amen. He's both Lord and God. Amen. And then I get some people in the church looking at me like, yeah, he is God. God was manifested in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the, word, the same was with it is God, was God, and is God. It's a tough little word. It's both now and, yes, it's both now and past tense, both present and past tense, kind of aorist. Huh? All things were made by him, and there wasn't anything made that was made except for he made it, and the word became flesh. Amen. The word was God, the word is God, the word was with God, and the word became flesh. Amen. And dwelt among us when beheld this glory as the only, glory of the only begotten Son of God. Of course, I'm just quoting... John chapter 1, people are amazed at looking at me. And of course, the, the, the Muslim guy goes, oh, no, 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 no. No, Jesus isn't God. He's a prophet. No, he's God. No, 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 he's a prophet. No, he's God. Is there, is there any wiggle room for you? Is he God? Did God die for you? Pretty radical, isn't it? Did God pour out his blood to ransom you? Did God work miracle power to change you? Yes. Is God's power greater than the power of Satan? Yes. Is the, is the obedience of Christ Jesus greater than, in effect upon your life than the disobedience of Adam? Yes. That was weak. That was weak. That was weak. Let me try it again. Is the obedience of Christ Jesus have a greater impact upon your life than the disobedience of Adam? Yes. Well, I pray that that's true. Amen. Because sin entered the world because of Adam's disobedience, but righteousness came by Christ Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Death entered by Adam, but life came by Jesus. Amen. Paul said this. I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to close here. I'm going to finish reading this verse of Scripture. Paul said this. He defines salvation like this in 
Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. He says that we are saved, delivered by the washing of the water of regeneration. You can't get cleaner than that. Amen. That's being born again. That's been new birth. We are saved. You've you're not been washed with the water of regeneration. You've not been made a new creation. You've not been made a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new and all things are of God. You've not been given a new heart, a new spirit with the Spirit of the Lord come and dwell on the inside of you. Have you not been washed with the water of regeneration? Then you're not saved. But the reality of it, the beautiful, wonderful thing of it, the good news is that every man, anyone who would just be willing to say, I don't want sin anymore. I want this life of God. I'm willing to be crucified with Christ. I'm not coming up for some kind of cheap little escape so I can believe that I'm okay when I'm wrong. I'm coming, I'm responding to be crucified with Christ Jesus. He loved me so much. He was crucified for me. I love, I'm in re the only legitimate response God says to love is obedience. Somebody said, I love God. I love him. I love him more than anybody I know. Do you obey him? Because the Lord says, if you love me, you'll obey me. He makes it very clear that obedience is the only legitimate response to love. Yes. How many theologians would I have on my side in that? Every one that I know of that has written any kind of biblical commentary, that has published, that goes back to Jonathan Edwards. You know, Jonathan, you can get Jonathan right now because of computers. I just love computers for this one reason. We, you know, we get to go into every library in the world. I get to sit in my living room or if I'm in a basement or a hotel, I can go into every library in the world. Except for I don't have access into the Vatican. That's okay. That everyone else, I can get there. And study everything that everybody ever said about the Word of God. And one of the things that everybody is going to say in common is that obedience is the only legitimate response to God's love. Not your love. Because we can make that up. I love Arco prices. I love kosher hot dogs. No, we're talking about God kind of love. Amen. The kind of love that Jesus modeled for us where he obeyed Father and went to a cross despising the shame. But there, suffering, bleeding, and dying in a hellacious torment, showing to all men what sin is worthy of. Sin is worthy of a brutal beating to where the back is scarred to the and flayed open to the, past the flesh to the bone. Beyond the point of death, it's worthy of cruel mocking. It's worthy of being tortured upon a cross and hanging there until you die. The death of one who's cursed. So he showed us. So your sin isn't bad? You've not met Jesus. You've not stood yet in the holy place and beheld the holiness of God. Because you do. You know, you look at Job and Job, God said, is perfect and upright, perfect and righteous in all of his ways. That's what God said about Job. God's not a liar. And he was given the testimony to Satan. But yet Job has another encounter at the end of the, the book. And he beholds that holiness of God. And he said, my comeliness or my uprightness has been turned into corruption. What I believed and what I held to and what I said, no one will take my righteousness from me. No one should let take my uprightness of heart or re remove my integrity. For I know my Redeemer lives and he stands upon the earth in the last day. And though my body should be turned into dust and, and though the worm should consume me, yet shall I live. Wow. Huh? Job 16. Isn't that powerful? Yet shall I live. Mm. The hope of the resurrection, the confidence of the resurrection. Resurrection. People, I mean, why can anyone hear the good news of the gospel and not wholeheartedly with total abandonment throw themselves into what God has, has ransomed and what God has provided and, and what God has freely given? Yes. Hey. God's looking for truth in the heart, in the parts. Father's not interested in religion. He hates it. It's a, realm of demo, it's a realm of the demonic. That's why he said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and his works you do. And man, you talk about the Haradim, the tremblers, from an outward show of things, they walked in amazing purity. Amazing. 
The Haredim today, the ultra-Orthodox Jews today, they aren't going to sit down and watch TV and watch lasciviousness and participate with that which arouses immoral thoughts and immoral feelings. They will not do it. But yet Christians by the mass do it. They participate with that which the Lord says, you do these things and you shall not inherit eternal life. You shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 5. I can go down a long list. I'm not going to do that. I'm just trying to warn you. You can read the Bible. God gave you the best notes. You can read for yourself. If you're serious about God, God's already serious about you. But if you're serious about God, you're going to start opening up your Bible and you're going to start reading. And I don't care. Somebody said, what version? I don't care. Anyone will do. Did it change you? But how serious are you with God? You just want religion. That's not what Father has for you. Father's got change. Yes. Who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who should dwell in your holy hill? Everybody says, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. No, the Lord says, no, you got to do something. First of all, I told you, you have to have clean hands and pure heart. And he's going to try that pure heart. And test it out. See how pure it is. And if you're willing, he's going to purify it. And he did so through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he does so through spiritual maturity and growth by this, us desiring the sincere nourishment of the word. And because the Holy Spirit is here to train us how to act like God. In our behavior, in our love, in our conduct, in our joy, in our peace, in goodness, in self-control. Because we're given all diligence to adding these things to our life and to making sure that they're in our life. See, we're not, we're not off over here thinking about these other things. We're, we're looking at true riches. We're interested in giving on diligence to make our calling election sure and, and, and being focused on having self-control and having brotherly kindness and having godliness and having divine love. Because if you do these things, you shall never stumble. You will not, not just fall, stumble. Once again, if you want proofs, don't go to lay preachers. Go to, go, go look at theological books that are written by people who've had to deal with the Word of God. Even, I don't care, Jesuit priests, fine. Doesn't matter. Episcopalian priests, fine. Doesn't matter. Because they're going to they're gonna have to confess what it is. Otherwise, the whole scholarly community, is gonna, there's going to be an outcry. Say, foul. That's not true. That's not what it says. Because the Word there is actually proven in Romans chapter 9 where both stumble and fall are used together concerning Israel. And the word for stumble is contrasted to fall there, and it is used, the word stumble is used there in 1 Peter chapter 1. You do these things and you're never going to stumble. Just walk in the Holy Ghost and you shall not, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh and the lust to, huh? To fulfill it. Come on, people. I want you to get into the Word of God. Amen. Because if this is not in you, I believe that you have no power to keep you. I believe that satanic thoughts can come and assail you and it takes you out because you don't have the defense of the Word of God. I'm put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to do what Romans 13, 15 says. I'm put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Huh? To fulfill its lust. Huh? Come on, people. Get the Word of God in you. Yes. Christ Jesus, the Word's come to live on the inside of you. Now get the Word of God in you. He's written it upon the tables of our heart and the tables of our mind so that we should do them. Yes. Hebrews 8.10. Hebrews 10.16. Should I go on? Yes. The response, appropriate response to that was yes. yes. I'll walk you through this thing. <laughs> you know, somebody said to me the other day, <laughs> They said, you know, because I, I answered the same question to uh, for them. and said the same thing about a dozen times. And I was on probably 30, 14 times. They said, how are you so patient? I said, I'm a pastor. I'm used to telling people a thousand times the same thing. No problem. And in many different ways. A friend of mine was actually calling out to a person saying, hey, hey. And calling their name. Calling their name. Come over here. And they're all just standing there looking. And I said, which one of you has this name? Raise your hand. So the person with that name raised their hand. Now you with the hand raised, please come here. You gotta say it in many different ways. How can you be so patient? No problem. I've been pastoring for 34 years. I'm used to saying it in so many different ways. 
over and over again, because that's the way Papa is. He's long suffering. He has enduring patience. He says, I love you, 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 but you've got to obey. You have to obey. And if you don't obey, and if you're not willing to walk with me, I'm not going to force you to walk with me. Nehemiah, he did a pretty good job. Cursed them, beat them, <laughs> grabbed their hair, pulled out their hair, and made them swear an oath to God, saying, <laughs> Josiah made everybody vow. Oh, is that Amaziah? Made everybody vow to obey the law and the word of God, or that if they should not, they would subject themselves to be putting to being put to death. And they all said, Amen. What a group of folks. He made them swear that they would be perfectly obedient to God or they would be put to death. And everyone said, Amen. It's true. What a pastoral ministry. Somebody said he's controlling. I've been beating nobody. Pulling nobody's hair out. God's not controlling. Satan is controlling. God sets life before us and says, Live. Here it is. I'll give you the option. I'll give you an opportunity to be blessed with all spiritual yeah. blessings in the heavenly places. To be blessed coming in and blessed going out. I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to have every good and perfect gift. I'll give you the opportunity to live in me and I'll live in you. I'll give you the opportunity to have my purity, my holiness, my righteousness. I'm like, I'm in. I'm totally in that it doesn't matter what's coming at me. I'm saying no. I have drawn a bloodline between myself and the world. I've drawn my bloodline of Christ Jesus between myself and the satanic realm. Satanic realm cannot come over to me across the bloodline. I can go over to it, but I'm going, no. I know sin and deception can create temporary insanity. And so I'm going I'm to lay out a principle before God and say, I'm going to walk in it. As you have said to me, walk in it. And there, God, the Word, God's Word, God, Christ Jesus, the Word, huh, huh? God, the Word, and His living, and His Word, God's Word, and the Holy Ghost and the Father is here surrounding me saying, holding my hand. They're like got a company around me saying, we can do this. One step at a time. Take the next step. Come on. Take the next step of righteousness. Say no to the spirit of disobedience. Come on. You can do this. Come on. You fall down. Okay. They're down on the ground. Oh, we've been at this now for 10 years. Okay. Come on. We've got two steps in two, 10 years. We've made a whole uh, growth. Uh, accomplishment of approximately one meter and we have an eternity to go. Come on now. <laughs> and the Lord's called us to come in the fullness of the measure, the maturity of the ministry of Jesus, even under a fully matured man and everybody sitting around like they're in, nurse, in nursery school. He's looking for somebody to have the keys to the kingdom. Amen. Besides just a few. Come on, people, rise up. Yeah. Rise up. Yeah. I said rise up. Yeah. Who will, who will abide in the tabernacle of the Lord? Who should dwell in the holy hill? He that walks in righteousness. He that walks uprightly. He that walks, really, you could say, in God, in the purity of God. And he that works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Stand with me. I'm doing that. I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have clean hands and a pure heart. Hallelujah. You know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk up rightly. I'm going to work righteousness and speak truth in my heart. And I got, the, I got the Holy Ghost equipping me to do it. God, the Holy Ghost is here to help you, to equip you. He's calling you. He's calling you. God is calling you. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart through unbelief. Don't be willing to hold on to your religion. Don't be willing to walk away from God when He's come all the way to suffer, bleed, and die for you. People, you've got to understand that the altar call at this moment in time, it's the most sacred time. It is the most sacred time. 
It's the most sacred time. You gotta, you're going to have to get a principle that you don't walk out when the altar call is starting and you don't walk in when it's, when it's starting. You just don't do that. You just got to understand. Things have got to become bigger. Things have got to become about souls, not about you. It's got to become about what God is doing, not about what you're doing. People's souls weigh in the balance. I understand why some men of God say, no baby's crying. No one moving. Don't anybody even breathe. Let there be no distraction kind of thing. God, the Holy Ghost, people's lives are weighing in the balance. People walked out of here already because they don't want to hear, they don't want to hear the gospel. They want to be told that they are right, that they, that they can do whatever they want to do, live however they want to live, and it's okay. But their soul is in the balance. And we want to, we're going to be used by God in every way we possibly can to reach those who have some, in some degree or some manner called upon the name of the Lord. There's so much religion. The Lord comes and even knocks on the door, the heart of religion. Banging on the door, say, let me in. Let me in, I'll come in and stuff with you. The Laodicean church, the Laodicean see in church, as it were, that state of lukewarmness, demanding it to be my way. Lovers of pleasure are more than lovers of God. Wanting to do it their own way. Saying that the life of holiness and consecration and sanctification is, is actually false doctrine. I actually... I never believed that anybody even thought that. I thought that people were like, yeah, I, I believe that, that the Bible teaches the doctrine of sanctification and doctrine of holiness and doctrine of righteousness, but um, I disagree with it or I'm not willing to commit to that. But now people are actually saying that those are false doctrines and misunderstanding of the Word of God. Because the old guys from back in the long ago were still under the oppression of the Roman Catholic Church. And that's why they believe that. And now because, because now God, Christ Jesus gave his blood for us at Calvary's cross. And he's brought forth this change in the dynamic of the spiritual realm. So now sin is no longer sin. And everybody's righteous and, and everybody's holy and everybody's separated and sanctified to God and pleasing unto God just by virtue that they've come into this program. And now, you know, this idea that somehow we've got to live in this place of consecration that demands obedience and response towards God no longer is valid. I don't think that there's anything that speaks more strongly to the, to the last days of a pro progressive and fast moving movement of apostasy and the working of seducing spirits than that. And I pray that every person in this place here, because I've lost everybody, everybody pretty much everybody who needed to get right with God's already walked out. And it certainly wasn't because God, the Holy Ghost, wasn't working on them and moving on their lives. Everybody that I see right now standing in this place, I know that you're consecrated to the Lord, that you committed to the Lord, you're everything in your life. And that there's... There's a willingness to do what's right. There's some of you who haven't been, haven't done it haven't gone all the way with God in your commitment, but there's a willingness. God says you've got to be both willing and? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, here's what I want to, I just want to turn this, turn this service because most of the service was directed at people sitting in here that didn't know the Lord. It was mostly directed to them. And just want to encourage you and say this to you. I want you to grab a hold of the reality of what Christ Jesus has done for you and recognize that you have clean hands and that you have pure heart. And that you're committed to walking in that and keeping that. That you, that you work, that you, what God has done by the wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost is He's empowered us to walk uprightly and to work righteousness and to have truth in the heart because he, the spirit of truth has come to live and, do, and dwell on the inside of us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
praise the name of Jesus. I want every one of you to recognize this, that God has called you to preach a gospel that says to people and addresses to people as well as to us individually, each of us, that our response to salvation is a response to the fact that a life that we once had has come to an end and we don't want to go back. In other words, we've come to a cross to be crucified with Christ, not to find some self-justification for our sin and our iniquity and our wrongdoing in a life that isn't submitted to God. We come to the cross to have a life fully consecrated and submitted to God so that the Holy Ghost can lead us and guide us and teach us. Hallelujah. Don't make it anything less. Don't make the gospel anything less. Because it's a false gospel and it's a deception at work. Don't make it anything less than being crucified with Christ. Don't make it anything less than being buried with Him by baptism into His death. Don't make it anything less than being raised up together with Him and living together with Him, alive together with Him, and seated in a heavenly realm with Him. Don't make it anything less. Don't make it anything less. Don't make it anything less than His life being made manifest in us. Don't make it anything less than walking in the Spirit, walking in the Holy Ghost, living in the Holy Ghost. Don't make it anything less than having now escaped from the corruption that is in the world. Don't make it anything less then old things are now passed away and behold, all things are new. Don't make it anything less than, than the divine nature. Don't make it anything less than all things are now of God. Don't make it anything less than the old man is crucified, that a new man is now risen. Don't make it anything less than having received the righteousness of God that we may be trained every day to walk in His righteousness, that having received the holiness of God, we may be trained every day to walk in His holiness. Don't make it anything less. Because if you do... You have another gospel. Don't make it anything less. Don't, don't go for another gospel. Don't, don't go for another gospel. Say, I'm not going for another gospel. I'm not going for another gospel. I'm not teaching another gospel. I'm not teaching another gospel. Father, we thank you for empowering us. Father, we thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for this life of Jesus. We thank you for your signs and for your wonders. But Lord, we thank you for your word that dwells in our heart and in our mouth. <laughs> Listen. God is looking for you to submit yourself completely and come under the authority of the Holy Ghost. Children, sons and daughters, I don't care how old you are. You're in your house. If you can't submit to your mother and father, you're not submitting to God or the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about godly parents. If you're rebellious to them, you're rebellious to God. That's the first place you need to start allowing the power of God to work in your life. You hear me? God is very practical. God is very real. You can't walk in defiance and disobedience against your parents and demon spirits not come rushing into your life. Trying to take authority over you. So today, get right. Get right by... First of all, repenting, committing yourself to the Lord, and, and submitting to the Holy Ghost. Submit to your parents. Submit to leadership around you in the Lord. Submit to the Word of God. And watch Father go to work on your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, right now, I just I bring up before the throne of grace the five people that got up and walked out who believed they're right with you. They bought into the full lies of religion and denominationalism and they cannot hear your word. 
Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that they will not be able to escape the seed that was sown into their heart today. I bind every foul spirit of hell, every unholy thing, everything unlike God. Right now in the name of Jesus, everything that would hold back the flow and the moving of the Spirit of the Lord in the lives of the people that are in this place. Father, we ask you to put your finger on it right now and identify it right now so it cannot have any impact or any effect. Just go ahead and give her her way. Father, that may there not be one single person in this place that will say, that says, yes, I will go, yes, I want to do it right, and that are unwilling to do it and unwilling to follow through. May there not be one single person in this place that will be stubborn or high minded or unwillingness to respond to you. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. That every life will be brought into order. From the front row to the back row, from the pulpit to the to the soundboard. Amen. From the platform to the soundboard. From the roof to the ceiling. In Jesus' name. Everything submitted to God in obedience to Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the healing anointing. Lord, we thank you that there need be no one in your body, in your church, that has any form of sickness or disease, that has any form either in spirit, like addictions, reoccurring, Wrong actions. Parents, let me tell you something. Horses kick their foals for wrong behavior. Because otherwise, it's a mess. You, it, there's, there's things that the Lord just, just let him straighten it out. Where they don't have reoccurring wrongdoing and you don't allow reoccurring wrongdoing because it's setting up a pattern for life. That's why we tell kids, young, you know, teenagers and whatnot, don't date because all it's doing is teaching you how to accept divorce. Because breaking up with one girlfriend, a boyfriend, and going to the next one, just teaching you, training you how to be divorced and live with it. Today, let God give you the ability right now by his spirit to be healed in that part of your body your, that part of your spirit that is out of order I don't care what it is if it's, if it's kidneys or if it's thyroid or whether it's virus or blood disease or that's out of order or whether it's continually being disobedient or stubborn or not willing to hearken into the, the ways of God and accommodating wrong behavior and bad behavior. You train up children how they're supposed to walk with God. Huh? Parents, 
I don't care how old they are. If your child is 17 years old, my children are 30 and down to 25. And I'm going to still tell them right and wrong. I'm going to say that's wrong or that's right. And it's going to be based upon the word of God and it's going to be based upon the wisdom that God gives. And there's sometimes that we constantly forget. How many of you, how many of you have your forgetters just working so good? The forgetter just constantly working. Forgetter works just constantly working, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Otherwise you would remember. Huh? Don't say yes and not mean it. And don't say no and not mean it. Because that's deceit. Are you with me? Yes. If you believe you're right, then say no, I'm right and you're wrong. And go on with the program. But don't be deceitful. Say, I'm right, you're wrong. It's my business, not your business. Just go ahead. We all know what we're doing. We all know what we're dealing with now. Right? Correct. This is just the transparency coming clean with God. Every one of you. Everybody in this place. Coming clean with God. Coming under divine order. Living by His Word. And living by the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Spirit has not come to prove the Word. He's come to confirm it. The Word proves the Spirit. Eh? The Word proves the Spirit. You try everything by the Word of God. Father, I thank you right now. You got sickness in your spirit and in your body? Let's get healed right now. Let's get healed right now. You got offense, unforgiveness in your spirit and your body? You got agreement? You got any agreement? With wrongdoing, wrong thinking, wrong things, let's get it fixed right now. Somebody said, how do I do it? Because now you're going to do what God says to do in his word. Amen. Amen. And, the, and the week's going to say I'm strong. Yes. And the sick's going to say I'm healed. Yes. And everybody's going to say it's not by might, not by power, but by, thy, by, by your spirit, says the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Father, if you hear, if you hear him, if you hear him, his healing power is already at work. He'll fix it. Can you hear me? Yes. Testing one, two, three. If things have been identified in your home, in your life, and it's not fixed or corrected, and it remains the same, hello, it's because you've not done anything about it. You did not obey. Period. Because when you put God the Holy Ghost on it, it changes. Amen. It does not remain the same. It's not the same behavior. It's not the same act action. It's not the same events. It changes. It changes. It changes. Daniel came up to me the other night and he was still having back problems. And I told him, I said, son, three weeks ago, I saw you healed. Because he, and he knew I was just constantly on him, dealing with it. I could see the pain in his body, but three weeks ago, I saw him healed. He said, dad, I want to see it. You know, faith gets to see. Faith gets to see it. Not just accept it but see it and know it. Not just accept it, but to see it and know it. That begins to bring change, observable change, in people who've been dealing with something in their body. They've got an ownership of it. It's mine. I've got it. I, you know, I'm going to deal with it every day. It's a problem on me. I have to feel the pain of it, the consequence of it. No, all of a sudden you see it. It, it just, it's gone. I was, I was in a situation recently, just want to share this with you about healing, and it was the craziest thing. No problem with my knees. Both my knees seized up on me. They seized up. I couldn't move them. It was intense pain. I couldn't move them. You know what I did? I said, it doesn't belong to me. It's not mine. I don't care how much pain it is. It doesn't belong to me. I walked it, I walked out of it. I walked out of it. Inside of five minutes, I walked out of it. 
I just walked out of it. However, I could have easily sat down in it. Now, I had seen faith just because of all the other past experiences in God's word. I had seen faith. I know what, it doesn't belong to me. I, I don't care what men say about it. I don't care what the symptoms are. I don't care how much pain is shooting through my body. It's not mine. I want you to grab a hold of it in every dimension of your life, people. Quit living in something that's wrong. Quit living in something that's wrong. Quit living in something that's wrong. I don't care if it's physical, spiritual, what it is. Quit living in something that's wrong. Stop it. Obey. Seek answers. Father will supply them. Ask the Lord to show you, where is it that I'm allowing something in my life that's working this problem? He'll show you. If there's stunting stuff stunting your growth, if there's things holding you back, if there's things that somehow it, it, it's, it's, it's on you, don't know what it is, ask Papa. Say, Father, sh show me. I want to see this. I want to be able to move forward. He'll show you. Especially with the application said, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going I'm to walk in divine health. Amen. 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 I'm not going to be a sloppy witness. <laughs> Amen. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Listen, real quickly, up in upstairs in, my re in our ready room, what we call our ready room, we're going to have a meeting right after this service. And the meetings, especially for people who want to find a way to help participate in what we're doing um, financially, to help participate financially in what we're doing in terms of building the new church in Oregon. If you want to participate with that financially and you're willing to discuss how you can bear the financial burden of it, how you can step in, like in the days of old, when they said, okay, we're going to bring of our substance to build the house of the Lord. I promise you that they began to step into substance and the multiplication of substance in whatever area they were participating, whether it was wood or mm -hmm. stone or gold or silver or grain or livestock or whatever it was. So if you want to be a part of that, understand how you can participate with what we got to do, especially over the next year financially, just come upstairs. We're just going to have a short meeting. There's some of you that maybe I know, I know there's some of you, there's many of you, you would just love to participate with it. It's just that where you're at financially, you can't really do much more than what you've already pledged. That's fine. The Lord knows according to each man's substance and individual ability. Okay? The Lord usually actually uses a, a word in the scripture that says, bring what your hand can reach. It's like you're on your tiptoes as far as your hand can reach. And that's actually translated, bring according to your ability. But the Hebrew word and phrase is to reach to, on your tiptoes, as far as that which your hand can reach. And as you do that, Papa's going to give you the ability to reach more. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And do more. But if there's anything we want to see happen, if there's anything that has got to happen, is God's people have got to be able and willing to move into a greater cooperation with Him, both in the realms of those things that we're talking about financially and also participating with the sacred. Because it's just like there's, a, there's many, many things about immaturity that makes it to where that you're just willing to go whichever way circumstances or situations turning you. The Lord wants you to be captivated by 
that which he's doing and moving with him in it. And we learn to do that by obeying his word. Yes. Amen. So, amen. amen. Praise the name of the Lord. If, if you have pledged something for the building of the church in Oregon, please go ahead and get that finished. Because it's, it's that time. The time of, of paying for it has come. If you haven't pledged anything and you want to pledge something, do so. As you have the ability to move in faith to do it. There isn't any constraint on anybody. No one's less than another for not doing something. But you, let God, you just let God the Holy Ghost touch you in the realms of faith. People took out mortgages for their own house. True. You spent money on your own house, on your own stuff. Well, if you will let the Lord show you, He'll help you understand how to move in faith, take out a mortgage for something that belongs to the kingdom. Huh? Yeah. Hallelujah. I got three hallelujahs, four grunts. <laughs> But I can understand why people don't get too excited about that to some respect. I don't have to understand why people don't get excited about the fact that God gave you a gift of righteousness and holiness. He's in you. People are becoming unglued with that. Amen. Well, we love, every, we love every one of you. We want God's best on you. And so, therefore, we're going to demand of you to be obedient to God. Worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. We're going to man, demand you to be obedient to God and do those things which He says for you to do in your daily life, in your consecration, in your commitment, to not allow things in your life that you know that's not right with God. Why? So that you can be blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. To do those things which God has told you to do. Why? So you can grow and mature. Amen. Amen. So come worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings. Find a bunch of people around you. Hug them. Bless them. Tell them that you love them. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. If there's anybody who wants prayer for anything, you're sick in your body, you're troubled in your heart, you're troubled in your spirit, then just let God, the Holy Ghost, come. Right where you're at right now and strengthen you. Maybe you don't understand things that need to be adjusted in your heart and in your life. The Lord is here to show you. He's here to reveal those things to you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sukambra Baba Satori Mamalana Malandola Bakuria Is the Renan